Hi, my name is João Santos and I'm part of Continuous Delivery Team at Zalando. And today I'm going to show you how we do continuous deployments to Kubernetes. First thing, does everyone know what Zalando is? Okay, so for those that don't know, Zalando is the biggest fashion platform in Europe. And to give you some context, Zalando has more than 1,800 tech employees and seven tech apps. Well, now eight. We run 341 AWS accounts. In the past, we used to run one account per team. And today, we run 73 Kubernetes clusters. So we still are in migration process. And for continuous delivery, at first, we used three centralized Jenkins shared by all the teams. As this didn't scale to the amount of developers and team we had, we provisioned one Jenkins per team in AWS. First, we did it with Transible, and Victor is probably already uh, seeing where this led, with a fixed number of workers for each Jenkins. And then, when this solution proved inadequate, with a microservice and with smart allocation of nodes based on time and workload. But this was not cost effective, required significant uh, operational effort, and it's not well adjusted to our needs. So when we moved to Kubernetes, we took the chance to implement our own CI system that's faster, tightly integrated with Zalando infrastructure, more cost effective, simpler to use, and more secure. We call this system Continuous Delivery Platform, or CDP for short. At Zalando, we think about software lifecycle as a developer journey with several milestones, starting from having an idea to putting it into production to retiring it. Of course, these steps can go back and forth and uh, maintaining takes more time than everything else, but all our tooling is built around this integrated vision. CDP covers three steps of this journey, building, testing, and deploying. CDP is composed of several microservices. This the central component is controller, which receives trigger events and schedules pipelines. Then we have the builder, which supervises the build execution and uploads some of the build artifacts. CDP runs a builder pod for every build. Builds are run in build VMs. Build VMs are EC2 instances with Ubuntu 16.04. Build VMs are terminated after the build, and they don't contain any credentials. This way they provide a clean and safe environment for every build. As the build VMs don't uh, have secrets or credentials, but still need to reach services that require authentication, we have a proxy between, between the build VMs and those services. The proxy ingests uh, credentials on HTTP requests to authorize services like our internal Docker registries, GitHub, and Nexus. Authorization is done per build VM based on the repository of the build. Requests are routed from the build VM to the proxy using bind. CDP proxy is built on top of our open source Skipper proxy. VM manager provisions build VMs and manages the pool size, ensuring we have enough build VMs while still being cost effective. The VM manager communicates with controller using an ACAD event bus. And at last but not least, deployment authorizer checks if the user is allowed to deploy to a cluster. A user in this case means a person that either pushed a commit, merged a pull request, or retriggered a pipeline. Now we are going to embark on the journey of a typical continuous deployment pipeline with CDP. In, the, in CDP, builds and deployments are configured using a single YAML file, not unlike Travis, for example. This file is only configured uh, configuration users have to do to use CDP. Everything else will work automatically. When the user creates a pull request or push, something uh, to an open pull request or protected branch, a pipeline starts. CDP exposes the status on GitHub and integrates with our developer console to provide information to the users. CDP also supports chat notifications for relevant events. Builds are not relevant because it would be too noisy. The first step of a typical pipeline is the build. In builds, we run tests, checks, and build and upload artifacts. <coughs> to start the build, controller asks the VM manager for a build VM. Then the controller starts a builder pod and sends updates to GitHub. The builder connects to the build VM using SSH. The repository gets cloned in the build VM through the proxy. Remember that build VMs don't have credentials, so they could not clone directly. The proxy, after checking with the controller that the build VM is legitimate, injects the required credentials. The builder runs the unit tests and the build in the build VM. 
users can provide an arbitrary number of comments for each build. Each of these comments is executed as a bash script and users have full uh, root access to the instance. CDP provides a Sonar client comment that drops Sonar scanner to integrate with our Sonar cube installation and GitHub. Sonar client provides several recipes with common ways to analyze a code base with Sonar cube and can create comments and status on pull requests. Sonar client communicates with Sonar cube and GitHub through the proxy, again because we don't have credentials to access these services on the build view. Docker push also happens through the proxy that injects not only the credentials but build, build metadata for compliance reasons. For example, uh, the who, com, who pushed commit, who and uh, the commit ID that led to that image creation. Docker pushes are limited by namespace and each team can only deploy to their own namespace. As you can see here, CDP provides some variables that are substituted in command. In this case, CDP build version will be replaced with a version consisting of a PR number uh, and a build counter if the pipeline belongs to a pull request, or branch name and build counter if it started from a push to a protected branch. CDP also provides, provides variables with useful information like repository, target and source branch, pull request number, commit IDs, and accountable user. Documentation is, can also be built in the build process in the build VM, and in which case it can be downloaded by the builder and uploaded to us an S3 bucket. The documents are exposed via a simple engineering service that authenticates incoming requests. If all the comments of the build were successful, the build is marked as succeeded and the pipeline moves to the next step. After we build our project, we want to deploy it. But before we look into deployment, the important thing to know is that at Zelano, we provision Kubernetes clusters in pairs. One cluster for tests, one cluster for production. CDP currently supports two deployment processes. Standard microservice deployment and a temporary deployment to run into a test. Because we want to make sure our application works as expected, we'll now see how the ladder works. After the build ended, CDP starts the next step, in this case, the end-to-end -end process. When the deployment starts, users get an IPSHED notification. The end-to-end -end process runs on a temporary namespace, so the first step is to create the namespace. Then the process applies the application manifests inside that namespace and, Docker and a Docker image with end-to-end -end tests is created in the namespace. So the, after this pod finishes running the tests, the namespace is removed and it's like it never existed. All the resources get destroyed. When process ends, users are notified again. Even after running end-to-end -end tests, we still want to test our application in a test environment to test against other services. To define in which cluster a specific process should deploy an application, we use the target property. In this case, we are going to deploy to a test cluster. As I said before, authorization for deployments is then based on user who pushed commit that triggered the build. Standard microservice deployment consists of applying Kubernetes manifests. This process is done using a pod with permissions to create and apply resources and to create and update CloudFormation stacks in case you need, still need something that cannot be done on Kubernetes. Variable substitution also works here. Variables set in the environment of the deployment pod are, repl are replaced in the Kubernetes manifests and CloudFormation templates. These variables can affect the behavior of the deployment pod. This allows us to use the same manifests and and cloud formation templates for multiple environments. We don't want to uh, deploy and approve changes to production, so we can set conditions when a deployment gets triggered. This, this can be either an event, a pull request or push, and or a target branch. For example, I, uh, you may only want to deploy something if it was pushed to master. In some cases, we might not want continuous deployment to a cluster. Our goal is to have continuous deployment, but cannot always happen. So, and usually, some teams don't use want to continuous deployment to production. For this reason, we can require human approval before executing a deployment process. If this property is set to true, 
The deployment is going to wait until a user with deployment access to the cluster approves the deployment. Users can also decline deployment, in which case uh, the step and the entire pipeline will fail. Approvals are done through our developer console. After the step is approved, the deployment will happen the same way it did in the test environment, but using the production values. And this concludes the deployment process and the pipeline. But besides code changes, there's a second way to trigger the pipelines in CDP. We call it a dependencies. CDP pipelines can also be started by pushing a Docker image to our internal Docker registries. When a Docker image is pushed, is pushed to our Docker registry, it notifies CDP through an SQS queue, in, uh, which in turn triggers pipelines that depend on the Docker image. The tag and full image names are then available inside the pipeline as environmental variables. This allows projects to be rebuilt when new versions of their base images are available. For example, if there are security fixes, you don't want this to be a manual process, and to keep deployment configuration separated from the code if necessary. Now that we covered um, how CDP works, I'm going to show you some stats, and the slide uh, didn't load for some reason. Okay, so there was a nice image here that's not here. Um, so 90% of the uh, CDP builds, uh, builds start in less than 12 seconds or less. And by builds, I mean actual user-defined steps. This includes the time necessary to get build VM, to configure it, and to clone the repository. This contrasts with our Jenkins setup, where waiting more than 40 seconds just to get a work for a job is not uncommon, let alone time to clone to your repository and start a build. And because it uses a common build VM pool, it does so at a fraction of the cost of our Jenkins setup. And despite still being the early days of Kubernetes at Zalando, currently CDP is already used for more than 2,000 deployments per week, which accounts for around 35% of all deployments at Zalando. And since we still have some time, I would now invite you to ask some questions. <laughs>